Descended right before he descended. What did he tell them? You're not just disciples anymore. You're now apostles. Apostle is where you're going to go and you're going to spread the word. You can be a disciple and, a, and an apostle at the same time. Soaking in, learning the word of God, learning what he has for you. But if you never get to where you're an apostle, it's good that you're a disciple, but you have to become an apostle. So after Jesus was ascended into heaven, they were no longer known as the disciples. They were known as the apostles. Because then they were out spreading what they had learned. How many days did they have with Jesus after he rose from the dead until he ascended? Do you remember how many days they were with him? How does it tell me today is 40. Four zero. That's called a crash course. He actually did a crash course. Forty days and nights. They were soaking in the Holy Spirit. They were soaking in everything that he had. And then before he ascended into heaven, he was like, go and spread the word. So we can be disciples, but we also need to be apostles. Um how many um People, do you think in their lifetime a percentage actually leads someone to the Lord? This is a bit of trivia I've done. It's not very high. One percent of Christians, one percent, actually lead someone to the Lord. So it's very, very low. And it's really it's good that we can sit and learn and soak everything in but if we don't spread it then where are we so um 
A disciple is a follower or a student of a teacher or a leader. An apostle is one who is sent out to spread the teachings that they have learned. Um, I went to college, nurse practitioner school with a lady, and she was probably as old or, or as older, older than I was. And I went, didn't go back to nurse practitioner school until I was over 40. And I said, where have you worked? She was already a nurse practitioner. And she said, well, I've just been going to school this whole time. And I'm like, well, where did you work before you went to school, like when you graduated? She said, well, I've just been going to school the whole time. I said, like, since you were 18? And she's like, yeah. And she said, I don't know that I can do anything with what I've learned. I'm kind of shy. I don't know that I can be someone who actually uses what I've learned, but I've learned a lot. And I said, how many degrees do you hold? And she said, I hold eight master's degrees. So she's made a profession out of just going to school. Yeah, so, I mean, that's great. And she's very, very knowledgeable. But I thought, what a waste. You know, she wasn't able to use her, even her nurse practitioner skills in taking care of the sick or um, uh, teaching in nursing school or whatever. She got a business degree. She said, well, I think I might open a business in somehow in nursing. And she got a teaching degree so she could teach nursing. Everything she did, she when she would get to right before she graduated, anxiety would set in. I'm about to graduate with another master's degree. And so what am I going to do? So I think about, can you imagine her student loans? <laughs> it's just one degree will set you back for 20 years. Um, but a lot of people do that when they're studying the Word of God. It's like, I'm just taking all this in. But they have a hard time spreading the Word. What, what do you think hinders people from spreading the Word? Fear. Fear. Fear of what? What are they afraid of? Mm -hmm. Rejection. Rejection. Yeah. Fear, fear of people laughing at you. Fear of some, somebody saying something. So, um, one of my prayers I've been praying is just give me boldness. You know, uh, you, you try to talk to people and you're like, oh, I feel like a blubbering idiot sometimes. What I'm saying, they're just looking at me like, really? And we talked about this in our Sunday school class, that um, it's always good when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you're actually spreading the word. But what's better than one-on-one? -on -one? Get you a partner. And I was telling them, I said, you know, when the pastor goes to see people, what does he do? He'll call up Andy. He'll call up Jean. They go in pairs a lot. And it, it helps when you're trying to speak to someone about the Word of God or spreading the Gospel and you feel like you're, I don't know what I'm going to say or am I saying the right thing? And somebody can pick up the slack for you and take it up. So while they're speaking, you're trying to think, okay, well, he, what he's saying is right. Let me add to that. So it's, all, it's always good to go in pairs. You know, your mom always taught you to never go out at night with, without a partner. It's the same thing when you're spreading the gospel, which is great for us to spread the gospel one-on-one, -on -one, but when you have a partner, it it, give, it emboldens you to spread the word. So, um, who do you think gave Christians the name of Christians? Did Christians just say, hey, let's be called Christians? Let's do that. Let's just be called Christians. It was a, it was a, a derogatory term for them. And it was given by, by people who were not Christians. And it's kind of like saying, um, oh, there goes a Bible thumper today. Somebody, um, that a Bible hub or a Bible thumper, they, they were saying, look at those Christians. That's what they are. They're followers of someone that had claimed to be the Son of God, but you know he wasn't the Son of God. So we'll just call them Christians. So Christians, the Christian name didn't come from as an endearing name. It's, this sounds good. Let's name ourselves the Christians um, in our group. We're going to be known as the Christians. That when they walked down the street, when people said, oh, there goes the Christians, it wasn't a good thing. Um, so it was given by people who were not in the Christian faith. So Paul talks about being a Christian, Christian disciple. So I want you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians 2. Find 
Galatians 2, 20. And this is what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ, and I know, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So he's saying, talking about being a Christian disciple. Learning and going out, going out. So that's really what our lesson um, about tonight is. Is it all comes down to missions, and you can be a missionary to your neighbor. You can be a missionary to your friend. You can be a missionary to um, someone in the church. You can be a missionary on a working witness team and go in state, out state, out of country. You can actually be a missionary to another foreign land for years. Um, missionary takes on a, a, a mean, a, has many, many meanings. It's just when, when you are in the Christian faith, you're all missionaries. Every, everyone is a, a missionary. Um, uh, you don't have to be an actual missionary going to another country to actually be a missionary. I say um, that every day that I'm in a mission field, every day I open the door of my office, I'm in a mission field, which a lot of y'all say that too, in your, in your um, work. Um, I'm sure, Carolyn, when you open that bus door every morning, <laughs> that's, you're letting all the ones out. So your bus is actually a mission field. Yeah. So um, the mission field can, can be anywhere. So... Um, I was kind of drawn to the the um, the parable about um, the uh, master who the his uh, servant owed him money, and then someone also owed him money, and so um, he owed his master so much money that. They took that money, their talents, uh, they were called talents back then, and a talent is 10,000 denarius, which um, one denarius is 15 cents, and that's what people usually made every day. So it would take them years and years and years to pay back. Well, he gave, the master gave him so many talents that the servant told him, please, 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 I will pay you back. I promise I will pay you back. Well, someone went in and converted that into American money. Do you know how much money he owed him in American money today, today's money, that he owed his master? Seven billion dollars. Seven billion dollars. And so there was no way... It, they, they figured it out. If he were to work for um, one talent, one denarius every day, which is 10,000 10, denarius is one talent. If, if he were to um, work years to pay that off to his master, do you know how many years it would take him to pay it off? 200,000 years to pay it off. So... Could he repay his master? He's not lived 200,000 years. He could never, ever repay his master. He, he said, I will repay you. I promise I will repay you. But there was no way that he could ever repay that. And um, to me, that's like um, the Lord, what he's done for us. <coughs> Can we ever repay him? And we we probably say in our prayer life, I'm going to pay you back. I'm so sorry that I did what I did. I promise you I'm going to pay you back. But we can never, ever pay him back. So when I was reading about that parable, it just jumped out at me that um, it was so much that that master had given him. 
And we don't know the details of why he had given him that much money or why he, um, it was so much. Now you talk about a rich master. If he had that much for one servant, um, he was a very, very rich master. So um, I just, it, it just struck me that we try to bargain with the Lord sometimes and, and say, you know, I'm going to repay you for everything you did. But really, we can't even scratch the surface of what He has done for us. So, um, read about, I want you to go first off to Acts 1 8. When I'm trying to find my books of the Bible, I sing them. Anybody remember singing the books of the Bible in Bible school? Nobody? Yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's it. So when I'm trying to find my, sometimes I'll be singing them, trying to figure out. Now, I never did get down the Old Testament good, but I got down the New Testament pretty good at one, one time. So yeah, I have just if you hear me saying it looks as I'm just trying to find where I'm at. Okay, um, Acts one eight, and I have um, I tried to write down in my Bible who preached on what verse when, and so Acts one eight. And I'll tell you who preached on them in a minute after I read it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now what is that called? That little part of scripture. What is that little part of scripture called? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Go ye. Okay. Andy? Looks like on my birthday, March the 3rd, 2019, he preached on that. And it looks like January 16th of 05, it's been a while, my daddy preached on that. Pastor Baker, May 12th. My daddy again, April 6th, 1997. This is the old Bible. I hate to get rid of it. My daughters love to get new Bibles. They was like, Mom, look at my new Bible. Look at my new Bible. This is a new, I'm going to learn this and this. And I have this new Bible, and they're real pretty. And I can't give, get myself to do away with my own Bible. Because uh, I guess it's just sentimental stuff. And when I drop it, like 50 things fall out of it. <laughs> and it's a lot of tears. <laughs> You're right. So we're going to talk about the Great Commission just a little bit. The Bible records Jesus giving the disciples the Great Commission in Acts 1.8. It is the last command given by Christ before his ascension. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is similar to Matthew 28.18-20, where Jesus tells the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations. He didn't tell them to go. He didn't say go make apostles of all the nations. He's saying go so they can learn. They need to learn so that they can soak all this in. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission was not just for the immediate disciples that he was speaking to, but is given to all believers. Today, the Great Commission is still being fulfilled by international missionary work, by local churches in actively seeking the lost in their community, in outreach activities, and by believers witnessing for Jesus Christ to their next door neighbor. The Great Commission will not end until when? When will the Great Commission end? <coughs> Until the consummation of the kingdom of heaven. Until Christ returns. 
That's when the Great Commission began. That is, during the church age today, all believers are commanded to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and go into all go into all the world, even if it starts right next door. Part of the Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations, meaning that this gospel should be preached in all of the world. A disciple is literally one that is dis disciplined or taught about the kingdom of God, and these disciples are to make disciples or students of other people once they have put their trust in Christ. No believer is supposed to be an underground or private believer. Christianity is not a covert operation. We must tell others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not optional. To be discipled is to be instructed and to learn from one who is a disciple themselves. We can never teach what we first do not possess. And so once a person receives saving faith from God, we are to impart this to others and to teach others to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. Okay. It's an imperative command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command that we are to go and preach the gospel. When Jesus told his disciples to go into the world, was it in, this an imperative command? Yes. It is the same type of command that a parent would yell to a child in the street, get out of the street right now. We cannot take the Great Commission as an optional, but as a as an option, but as a direct command given by the Lord Jesus Christ. If he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. I thought that was a good saying up there. And by the way, as some have believed, there is no gift for sharing the gospel. We are all to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are lost. Why wouldn't we, knowing the final destination and fate of those who die without Christ? The good news must be shared. If we have a cure for cancer and, and we knew that thousands of people are dying every day from this deadly disease, why wouldn't we want to offer this cure in this case, eternal life for those who are perishing. To not share the gospel is to be negligent to our duties. When we keep this good news to ourselves, it reminds me of the, par the parable of the talents, and that's what we just talked about. Um, how awful it is not to share the news and participate in rescuing the perishing. There is no excuse for not doing it. What keeps most of us from doing it is... Fear. We talked about fear. Fear, which and that is a snare. The devil uses that to us. He puts the seed of doubt and fear into our lives. Should we not fear God more and understand that He will hold us responsible someday on the day of His visitation? So we know what the Great Commission is. Do you know what the Great Omission is? Not doing it. Not doing it. You can either be, go with the Great Commission or go with the Great Omission. Only a small fraction of church, act, church actively shares the faith, faith with the lost. Less than one in ten will share their faith, faith with at least one other person in their lifetime. Only one in twenty will ever lead someone to faith in Christ during their life. That is why for most Christians it's called the Great Omission. There are sins of commission and sins of omission and I believe not being involved with the Great Commission is a sin of omission. Jude tells us to save others by snatching them out of the fire. Paul asked the church of Ephesus to pray also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So even the apostles had trouble sometimes being bold. Um, they had their life to fear for because a lot of times where they were, if they spoke about Christianity, they were taken and um, threatened with their lives. To make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Paul declared that I am not ashamed of the gospel 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews, Jew first, and also to the Greek. By the way, when we share the gospel, we are not responsible for the outcome. You're not held responsible for the outcome. We are only held responsible for sharing the gospel. God is, res is responsible for the outcome. We can only sow the seed of the word and leave the results back to God. Um, many profess Christ when they are comfortable with other Christians, but they do not profess Christ to the lost. It's easy to profess Christ in, in here, isn't it? It's just easy. We, that's what we're here for. That's what we talk about. But if we were to be put in a situation where we had 50 people in front of us who were not Christian, it's not quite as easy to be bold and not be fearful of, of uh, professing Christ to them. So I'm going to tell you a little story. 20 years ago, a man was walking his dog about 5.30 in the morning when he spotted smoke coming out of a two-story house. He looked around and he saw that there was no chimney for a fireplace, so he thought the occupants might be in danger. He went to the porch and peeked into the living room and saw smoke coming out of the kitchen area. This is when he knew that there was a fire and he started pounding on the door. He rang the doorbell furiously but got no response. Then he started pounding so hard on the front door that he thought he might break it down and the neighborhood dog started barking and the light started coming on in the neighborhood. Finally, a light went on in the second floor of the house and when a man came down to the living room, he re then realized that there was smoke coming out of his kitchen. This was long before smoke detectors were commonly used. The man ran upstairs to evacuate his family. The family escaped with what could have been a disastrous fire. Here is the analogy. There is a fire coming. The man, the man who was walking his dog didn't think, well, I don't want anyone to just... To, to, disturb, to disturb anyone at this hour, and I don't want to embarrass myself. No, he was bold and did everything within his power that he could to warn the occupants of the fire. There is another fire coming. Jesus spoke of it more than heaven, and in fact, more than just about anything else that he ever taught in the gospel. Hell is, a, is very real. Should we not fear for those who don't know about a fire that is coming and be bold enough to take whatever steps are necessary? <coughs> who cares if you if who cares if you are embarrassed or you are humiliated? Shouldn't we care enough to warn the occupants of this coming fire, like our neighbors, our friends, our family, even strangers? Remember that the power is in the message, not in the messenger. If God can use even shy, timid, tongue-twisted people, then He can use you. So I hope you got something out of the lesson tonight. Um, you know, can I testify? You can testify. I love it. I don't know that there is a shyer person on the planet than my dad. He, uh, it is not his skill set to make conversation happen. And the older he gets, the less he can hear, so the worse he is about being able to just master the conversation and just engage people. But uh, I'll never forget, he was telling me a story the other day that he had uh, moved home from the military and uh, found out that uh, his to soon to be father in law had moved to Alabama with his fiance, so he just chased him down and still dated her a couple of years, but in Alabama, he went to an altar of prayer, and when he came in at night and everything was dark, he just wanted to slip down the altar and pray, but when he was kneeling, somebody raised up from the other side of the altar. He was prostrate, prostrate before the Lord, you know, there at the altar. His name was Deason, and Deason, he said, taught me a passion for calling on people and just going, and I was thinking, you know, you, one of the things you asked me, you know, why don't we go? And the thing that was so easy that came up was fear. But I think schedule also. It's not in my schedule. I am a caller today, not because I'm a minister, because I have 
of my four mentors that are pastors that have mentored me over the years. I'm not a caller because of them. I'm a caller because of my daddy. We always would chase the roughest, toughest, beer drinking, this, you know, worst option people in the world. And yet he would just make friends with them. And uh, over the years, he's not led multitudes to the Lord because it's hard for him. But he always missed it. He always called. It was part of his routine. And now in his elderly years, he's just taking care of a dementia wife. He, he, he is most frustrated because he can't make his calls at 82 years old. And uh, I think I think uh, that was such a good statement there at the end. I'd like for you to make it again. Uh, which was, uh, well, you can make money when, when I quit talking, but, uh, you know, the power isn't in the person, it's in, it's in the going, it's in the obeying. But uh, I uh, wish I was better at it, and uh, I do like to do it. And um, I've got someone on the lake that I'm going to go visit. But, uh, you know, I, I believe that there's, there, there's power in the going. Just creating relationship and not being afraid to, to witness the gospel. And uh, that's that's my that's my pattern. Ministers today don't call. Young families today don't want you to call. Uh, but but we still can start conversations uh, and talk about the Lord. I know um, my dad used to say today in the week that he would go call them, go call on people. And I heard from a lady say one time, I always get my house clean on Tuesdays because I don't know if your daddy might show up. I said, my daddy wouldn't care if your house is clean or dirty. But everyone in the church knew that that day was, you may get a call from the pastor that day. I don't mean a telephone call. He's going to show up at your uh, doorstep. So uh, that's how he learned the people of the community and he became friends with so many people in this community that didn't even go to our church. Um, he would try to go and call on, on different people. And, um, he became a friend to them. Billy witnessed to me about the uh, Presbyterian pastor that was just retired recently that he would come by and visit God loves the man. And of course, David doesn't go anywhere. Right. Uh, you, it might be different. People <coughs> can't get out and go. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you said earlier about it, they, she, my mother said there was, she made it a point so many times. She said, you're going to have more people in hell not for what they did, for what, for what they did not do, for what God called them to do and they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it. It's always a part of the... Uh, you see it so much in the church, everybody is complaining. You know, <coughs> the preacher needs to go see somebody. Mary Ann, she's a preacher's daughter, she needs to go see somebody. Well, the bars is going to go see somebody. It's you. It's always past the buck. You know, it's somebody else's call. It's not that. My call is to, I, I pay my time. I, I come to church on Sunday morning. Sometimes on Sunday night. But I, I can't. I don't have the personality. Brother Clint was a bashful man. He went out because of God. Right. Now, when you got to know him, he didn't. He, he didn't just, it wasn't his nature to knock people down. David just walks in and everybody knows. He knows. I mean, they know this guy likes me and loves me. But the way, he might tell you, I'm praying for the people of that. <laughs> well, um, one of the doctors that I work with, there was something going on in the world, I can't remember, not long ago, and, and uh, 
when they were talking about wars and different things, and and uh, he was concerned. And he was he's from another country. And he, you know, they talk about like if sending missiles to the United States and like blowing up the United States. And he, I said, well, I'm not going to be here. Well, where are you going? <laughs> I said, I'm going to be raptured. He said, what is raptured? And I said, I'm going to mind. I feel that God, Jesus is coming back and he's going to take me with him. He's coming back. I said, yeah, he's coming back and I'm going with him. He's like, I said, um, did you not learn, like study that in your religion? And he said, I don't ever remember the priest telling us that. And I thought to myself, that's so sad that, you know, he wasn't even familiar with the rapture. That he was concerned about where I was going. So I told him I wasn't going to be raptured. I'm not going to be here. So um, it's the little things like that, just plant, planting the seeds. Yeah. Okay, anybody have any prayer requests tonight? A good friend of mine, who the rail. Of all, that's got cancer. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Diddy has uh, had some changes in you know, her thing. They have palliative care with her now. She has David Dixon this week, I think that I did too. She, you're not physically hard to move. I understand the time she filled it up and stopped going to it. But I fall for it. But uh, we need to remember her. Some people may not know this church was always, she was an Adventist, she died in this church. Talking about D. Engle. And D. Uh, the property where, where uh, Parson did. Uh, Brother Johnny said, "You reckon they can sell that?" I said, "I don't know what she's selling. I'm pretty sure she did." And she did. Let her cousin get to her. Right. That's that's what she. You know, she did that. Yeah. She is going through a lot of trying physical and um, mental problems. Um, I think the little girl in troop that has the cancer, what's her name called? That little Georgia? Georgia. Oh, Georgia, yeah. They, they got some good news, but they don't have all the results back. And so continue to pray for her. I think she's three or four years old. She has brain cancer. <coughs> Anyone else? Unspoken. Unspoken. We'll stand and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Yeah, I'm going to tell you how much water knowledge.